Okay, so before we get into some specific topics like addiction or sleep or hunger or brain damage, probably should go over some some just basics, some basic overviews of anatomy, some basic overviews of the field of biological psychology. Biological psychology is, you know, it's a very broad field. Sometimes it's just called biopsychology. And it's simply looking at biological functions and how that relates to certain mental processes or behaviors and how behaviors and mental processes affect the biology. And that's everything from genetics um, <clears throat> to the nervous system to how neurons work and neurotransmitters and all those kinds of things. So let's, get, let's give a little bit of an overview. First, just the approach, the approach of a more biological way of thinking about psychology. Well, there's a lot of different areas in psychology. It's a very broad field. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, approach takes a very big picture, maybe social psychology, developmental psychology, looking at the whole. Sometimes that's called a holistic approach. Sometimes a gestalt approach. And the idea is that you know, to understand these components of behavior, they can't really be reduced to the components. You have to look at the big picture. Perfectly reasonable way of approaching psychology. But still another approach is to look at the small things, a reductionistic or reductionism approach. We look at the small things like neurons, like cells, like neurotransmitters. Maybe you look at simple mechanisms of behavior like associative learning. And so neurology and biopsychology and uh, theories of associative learning tend to be a little bit more reductionistic. We can understand complex behaviors in a way by looking at simple mechanisms of learning and some of the structure and physiology involved. This class certainly is on the more reductionistic end of the spectrum of psychology we look for basic principles that then apply to many other principles in psychology. Um, let me give you some examples. We know that neurons work in very similar ways in all kinds of uh, animals, everything from insects to rats to people. We can theorize and look at how those mechanisms work and have a better understanding of how human brains work and how chemistry works in the human brain. Another subdivision, really, when thinking about especially research or aspects of psychology is whether uh, the approach is applied or basic. When we talk about applied research, what we're doing is we're thinking about how research, experiments, or even practices have an applied function. Do they, for example, help kids maybe on the autism spectrum? So you might do uh, research with children or even with uh, non-human animals like rats and, and, and pigeons to get and understand principles that might affect their behavior, that might help their behavior. Same with therapy. We might um, research about what practices work best in helping people to achieve some sort of wellness. We might also think about the drugs that can help them as well. Apply, this stuff helps in a specific uh, problem. So research maybe at a pharmaceutical company are very concerned about um, developing maybe psychoactive drugs that help depression or help anxiety or, or another kind of disorder. They're really focused on that. More basic research, which is oftentimes, but not always, kind of the focus of academic research is, is just looking at, you know, increasing our knowledge, increasing our understanding by having a better understanding of principles. Maybe later they'll have application, but that's not the goal of basic research. So here's me with my in my lab looking at how brain waves correlate to certain types of cognitive behavior. I'm not really trying to solve a problem per se, although my work might have some application. I'm more interested in coming up with good, strong theories of how things work. Here's one of my students in a physiology lab. This research here, 
kind of fascinates me. This is optogenetics, looking at how neurons using genetic implants, um, genetic manipulation can affect cells, neurons firing using light. Now that research might end up in the future really helping people with addictions or depression, but first we need to understand how the basic principles work. So applied research is really goal-oriented in terms of solving problems. Basic research is goal-oriented in increasing our knowledge, increasing our understanding. Okay, let's look at some subfields, and there are a lot of subfields. Each of these subfields of biopsychology, um, you know, they have their own journals, they have their own conferences. Now, I want to use the word neuroscience here, and I'd like to use that word a lot in this course. Neuroscience is kind of a blanket um, term for any field that is really looking at um, the nervous system and its effects on everything from just how it works or maybe things that go wrong and neurology or how it affects behavior, how we understand um, thinking and cognition, neuroscience, you know, that's really the buzzword these days. And this class is really uh, about um, neuroscience, about an introduction to behavioral neuroscience. Cognitive ne neuroscience is interested in how the brain works, um, oftentimes focusing on human behavior, but not always, and uh, how it works and is affecting you know, some higher cognitions, such as memory or language or perception or learning. I and mean, it can draw from a lot of different fields, everything from genetics to computer modeling to imaging. So a big field now is neuroimaging, watching the brain in action. So we might use things like a functional MRI or a PET scan or electroencephalography to image what the brain is doing during action. That, tells, that can tell us a lot about everything from learning and memory and perception and cognition. So here are some other subfields. Physiological psychology, they are interested in how the nervous system works, how physiology works uh, in the body, um, and specifically how that um, is, a, is affected and affected by uh, certain behaviors. Now, here's what a physiological psychologist might focus on. They might use like animal models. They tend to use a little bit uh, more invasive processes. This is known as vivisection, the dissection of living organisms to better understand how they work. You might be recording from, let's say, the uh, hippocampus while an animal is learning memory or from the uh, visual cortex during perception of an animal. Um, so this tends to be a little bit more, you know, digging into the brain. Psychophysiology sounds a lot similar. Physiological psychology, psychophysiology, they have a lot of similarities. But uh, psychophysiology tends to be a little bit uh, more focused on human behavior, using human participants, and using recording devices like e EEGs, electroencephalography, um, heart rate, uh, electrodermal, EDR, electrodermal responses, EMG, um, muscle activity, but also Im other imaging devices like MRIs and PET scans and, and things like that. Also interested in how the body and the brain is working and how that correlates with specific behavior. A little bit more human focused. Here are some other subspecialties. People can be behavioral neuroendocrinology. Sometimes it's called behavioral endocrinology. It depends on what you read. And this is looking at hormones hormones and behavior, like the effect of testosterone on aggression or cortisol and stress. Um, there's a lot of digestive hormones, these kinds of things. Behavioral genetics, this is a really big growing field now because we're having a much better understanding of genes that correlate with specific behaviors. We're getting genetic makeups of even complex behaviors like anxiety disorder, or depression. Um, this oftentimes ties in with evolutionary psychology, um, looks at natural history, evolution, um, how natural history has shaped us to have the behavior we have even in a modern world. 
we'll get into epigenetics, how our genetics um, and how our genetics are used can be affected by behavior. Um, so these things kind of go hand in hand. Behavioral genetics, evolutionary psychology, a lot of similarities. There's also psychopharmacology as a subspecialty, sometimes called psychoneuropharmacology. This is looking at drugs, how they affect neurotransmitters in our brain, our own chemistry in our brain. This could be everything from a drug that might help people with depression and anxiety to recreational drugs that like alcohol or cocaine or marijuana. This is that interaction, big growing field as well. Okay, so why are you taking this class anyway? I know, because you have to take this class. But why is it important for a psychologist or psychology major to have a class like this, to learn about the brain? Um, well, I can think of a lot of reasons, um, but I'm going to go through just a few, and hopefully get you into that perspective. Well, one thing, you know, we have a growing instance of diagnosis of developmental disorders such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and autism and these kinds of things and these have very strong biological components and maybe you have a better understanding of these phenomena when you understand the underlying causes but we also you know are medicating like we've never had before the the amount of of Ritalin and other uh, stimulants that we give children, I mean, really grew a lot in the 1990s, even in the 2000s, kind of tapered off since then. But, you know, we are drugging um, a lot of kids. We should know how these work, why they work, when they aren't appropriate. We're also, in the United States, we take a lot of psychoactive drugs, which affect our nervous system. This is also growing around the world. This is a growing phenomenon. I mean, antidepressants increased 400% just between 2005 and 2008. 11% of Americans over 12 take an antidepressant. How do these work? Do they work? In what capacity? What are the side effects? How do they work physiologically? That will tell you a great deal about the symptoms of depression and other components. You know, we are, you know, in the United States, we take a lot of drugs. We take so many drugs. In fact, one of the, the leading uh, problems in drugs are drugs that are taken, that are prescription drugs, but aren't taken for what they're supposed to be taken for. Um, we're seeing a really big rise in prescription drugs being taken or misused and even causing a great deal of overdose, especially in things like um, Oxycontin or things that mimic morphine. We take so many drugs, in fact, in the United States, and these drugs go into us and go through us and, and end up in our water system. So much so that we can test fish and fish have antidepressants in them just from the water. Um, of course, they're a lot happier fish, but um, you know this is a big growing issue. You should have some understanding of how this works and maybe when it's appropriate and not appropriate and those kinds of things. In fact, if you go into, let's say, counseling or you go into applied aspects of psychology and you have people who come into your office, I think one of the first questions you need to ask them is, what drugs are you taking? What drugs are the people around you taking? Also, you know, just to guard you against pseudoscience. I mean, there's a lot of really bad science out there about the brain. Here's one of my favorite examples, homeopathy. Homeopathy is, our, the idea is that they are pills that contain the essence, I don't know what that means, the essence of some kind of helping agent. But the amount is so tiny one billionth of a of amount that it is able to seep into our systems more easily. I don't know, you know. It is extremely expensive, and it basically what you're taking are sugar pills. You're taking pills that have nothing in them, or they have something in them that's so small, or no efficacy of the of whether they work or not. It's a multi-million dollar industry. And you can take these drugs, and let's say it's a drug that makes you uh, less depressed. Um, when you take the drug, you will eventually become less depressed because 
uh, as the regression to the mean tells us, the idea of you were feeling bad, you're going to get better. Unless you have chronic depression, you're going to get better. And if you really believe that the drug helps, it will help you because it's a, it, it, your, your conscious mind will believe that. And you could take a sugar pill. If you think it's going to work, it's going to work in that fashion. One of my favorites is you can get homeopathy. Again, this is a placebo um, for your pets. This, this is really strange to me because let's say that the pet is listless and you give them a, a pill that is um, a homeopathy that helps them be more active. And you notice the dog gets more active. Well, that's because it's a placebo for your perception. The only way it works on the dog is if the dog really thinks the pill is going to help their activity. Dog, dogs can't do that. Got to watch out for that. There's so many advances going on now. The, the, it's just, you can't even keep up with it. So many great advances. You know, one of the advances is, is trying to understand the genetics and physiology of Alzheimer's. I think it's going to be a wonderful thing if someday uh, you don't have to worry about that, about worrying about getting Alzheimer or a loved one getting Alzheimer's. This is, a, is really a, a, a terrible um, disease that takes people's self, takes people's memories away. But we're making such great advances. You should be excited by that. Here's, a, here's an example of something to be excited about, which is interesting and also scary. Here's a, here's a genetically modified mouse. They did this at Princeton. This is doogie mice, the doogie mice. And uh, it was named for uh, a TV show called Doogie Hauser about a tiny, um, about a young kid who becomes a doctor because he's so smart. But it's a genetically modified mouse that produces more of a type of receptor in the hippocampus. I don't necessarily need you to know that now. You will later. Um, that helps in memory. NMDA receptors help in memory. So what this mouse who's genetically modified to have more NMDA receptors is that it's smarter. You've genetically modified a mouse to have a greater memory. So here's the task that they do with a little doogie mouse. They show the, the mice to uh, uh, one object. They show them one object and they get used to it and, and they explore it. And then a couple weeks later, they show the same object and a new object. Now, mice will always go up to new objects and explore them. They will explore them. But if he remembers that he saw this one two weeks ago, he won't explore it as much. A doogie mouse won't explore that one it saw two weeks ago, but another mouse will forget it and explore it. We also see improvement in maze running and all this. This is a, 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 a genetic modification that affects memory and intelligence. Where are we going to go from here? Where are we going to increase? Do we, will we see it helping people with memory disabilities or Alzheimer's? Will we see technologies like this that affect memory, enhance memory, enhance intelligence? We'll get to that at the end of class. Here's a drug. It's called propanolol, and it blocks memories from forming or the emotional components of memories. So this might be very important for somebody who um, has a traumatic event like post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very crippling disorder. Maybe if somebody had a, a bad event like was in a war zone or sexual assault or in an accident and they get propanolol, they don't have the recurring memories, what we call invasive thoughts. Um, and maybe they don't suffer from the stress disorder. A uh, lot of ethical questions going on here about pills that affect or diminish memory. What about addiction? Um, if, let's say, you work with kids or you work with uh, adults and you're trying to help them uh, live better lives, uh, the number one thing you'll probably see uh, is uh, forms of anxiety and depression and addiction. Addiction will always be there. People around them being addicted, them being addicted, ad addicted to uh, cigarettes and alcohol and heroin and even gambling. Um, these are biological components. These are learned components and biological components. Understanding the biology will help you tremendously in this treatment. Now we get back to sort of pseudoscience again, you know. What about 
uh, you know, bad stuff. Like there was a time where psychosurgery was really big. Um, this is somebody getting a frontal lobotomy. This is uh, people not understanding the science very well. And, you know, 40,000 people in the United States had this surgery. It's really a terrible thing. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about that. You know, they stick at literally something called an ice pick. They call this tool an ice pick. And you go in, you swish around the brain. And for some people, it made them calm, and some people, it made them disoriented, and some it affected their intelligence, and some it didn't. And it's just not a very good history in psychology and biopsychology. And then we start asking questions of, do we have anything like this going on today? I mean, we don't give from lobotomies today. We don't do psychosurgery today. But we come back to that issue of giving out a lot of pills uh, and is that our today's lobotomy? I don't know. These are ethical questions, difficult to answer. And at the end of this class, one of my favorite topics is to think about the future, about computers interfacing with uh, brain tissue, brain-computer interface. Uh, and, uh, and what about changing and modifying with genetics or nanotechnology, changing what it is to be human, making people artificially smart or fusing with robots? These are all the kinds of things going on today and projecting to the future. So we'll get into that. You know, this uh, idea of controlling things like a computer with uh, the brain is being done. And it's not very good right now, but doesn't mean it's not going to get better. So, you know, we have tried this equipment in our lab. It's called Emotive, and it reads the brain waves, and it controls objects on a computer screen. It's very hard to use, but the fact that this machine is translating neural activity to computer activity is pretty interesting. Here's another one we've tried in our lab, NeuroSky. You can actually get a version of this in Amazon. It's really pretty cheap and play with it. Um, we've tried this in our lab too. It's hard to use, but we're at the beginning. So now we get into natural history. Um, you know, we have in our brain um, kind of an older brain. Sometimes we call it the paleocortex, older brain, um, that hasn't changed a lot. And we have a neocortex, a new brain, that maybe has changed a little bit. But how we evolved and our natural history plays a big role in our motivations today, even if they don't make a lot of sense today. So let me give you an example. Here's a kind of a depiction of Australopithecus, our old ancestors, three million years ago, five million years ago. Now, what was their diet like? Well, there wasn't a lot of fat, there wasn't a lot of simple sugars, and there wasn't a lot of salt. They were there. But these are things that we need. We need salt for our brain to work. And so their brain has evolved to be very sensitive to the taste of salt and sugars and fats and to find that very rewarding. But now today, the food that we eat is abundant with those flavors that the old brain craves and loves and wants because it's still kind of an Australopithecus brain. But we're in a modern society where this stuff is abundant. And sometimes, and often, the brain doesn't know not to want these things. And so we have these tremendous increase in obesity. Look at the United States down here, the percentage of obesity. This is growing around the world. How does that work? What's the biology? What's the physiology? And then I think of this. This is the basic researcher in me. I think of the fact that to study the brain and the nervous system is just interesting. It's just a fascinating ball of goo, you know? This physicist Richard Feynman said, science is like sex. Sometimes something useful comes out, but that is not the reason we're doing it. We're doing it because we're investigating. We're interested. And so one of the reasons that you should take a course like this is because the brain is just freaking interesting. Okay, so let's go through some terms, some terminology about the nervous system just to get ourselves um, to understand some basics before we get into some details. Well, that's the brain. And we're going to learn some anatomy of the brain for sure. That's the left hemisphere. You have the wrinkly outer cortex. And 
Sometimes we have to use anatomical directions to understand where things are in relationship to other parts of the brain. We're going to have to get into that when we get into a little bit of functional neuroanatomy. So for example, if you cut right down the middle, the longitudinal fissure, if you cut right down the middle and you look at this, which is the left hemisphere, um, we're looking at what's called a sagittal cut. And in the sagittal cut, you can see a lot of anatomy. Uh, there's the thalamus and the corpus callosum and the pons and the medulla, the cerebellum, um, but that's a sagittal cut. And we'll be looking at a lot of sagittal cuts and you should know what cut that is. This is a coronal cut, uh, it's sometimes called a cross cut. And you can see that plane right down there. And in there you can see the outer cortex, the bumps are called a gyrus, right? And the inside right here, these little folds that go in are called sulci or a sulcus. Here are some empty places called ventricles where we have fluid. You can see the gray matter and the white matter. The white matter has a lot of fat to it. We'll talk about that. But we're going to look at some coronal cuts and you should be able to recognize. And finally, you have the horizontal cut, which um, would be from the front to the back. We're looking down on the top of the brain. And we can still see those ventricles. We can see the frontal part of the brain, the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe. Directionally, if something it goes from the outside to the inside, the closer to the middle of, of, of a structure, we call that medial. For example, there's a part of the thalamus called the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. It's towards the middle of the brain in that structure. To the outside, if it's more out, we call that lateral. And so there is a lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. This is a part of the brain of the thalamus that's more on the outside of the thalamus, towards the outer part. So medial and lateral. And then we have some other directional. So let's go over a few of them. Superior means something is above. And if you look at this structure here, I'm going to zoom in on this structure. This is known as the tectum right in here. But it's made up of two components, one above the other. So they're known as colliculi, the superior colliculus, and down below it is the inferior colliculus, above and below, superior and inferior. Dorsal and superior in terms of the brain are very similar. We think of a dorsal fin on the back, but the brain is kind of rotated, the head is kind of rotated, so that really this is dorsal. dorsal and the bottom of the brain is ventral. Dorsal, this is a dorsal view, and that's a ventral underneath. By the way, what's this cut? A good, sagittal cut, okay? And then we have towards the front, this is the frontal lobe, this is the back. We call that anterior, so structures can be anterior to another structure. Sometimes called rostral, rostral means towards the nose, but I think I'll use anterior more often. And then towards the back of the brain, posterior superior, inferior, dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. Now we have some things that cover the brain, this tissue that covers the brain, secures the brain. These are known as the meninges and these have different layers as well. Right up against the skull we have what's known as the dura mater. This is nice and thick. It's very protective. The dura mater is very protective. Then we have a thin layer here that goes right against the gyrus, right down into the sulcus, and that's known as the pia mater. That's closest to the brain. And then between the two, we have a space known as the arachnoid space or the arachnoid membrane. Arachnoid means spider. It looks like a spider web. And a lot of blood vessels go through there. A lot of cerebral spinal fluid goes through there. And sometimes, every once in a while, you get a bacterial infection in there or a viral infection in there, and you get meningitis. And you don't want that. That's a bad thing, especially bacterial meningitis. So, dura mater is the outermost layer, thick. Pia mater is thin, right up against um, the brain itself. This follows the brain and the spinal cord. 
you have the arachnoid membrane and the space, the web-like space, sometimes called the subarachnoid space. There's also this fluid that flows in the arachnoid space and flows in the ventricles inside the brain and flows in our, in our spine, cerebral spinal fluid. And it's constantly replacing itself. It's pulling things out. It's adding nutrients. Um, and it is kind of what happens is, is the blood is kind of filtered through this stuff called the choroid plexus. I don't think I'm going to have you know choroid plexus, but that's just a filtering system, and you got to keep that fluid going, constantly replenishing itself. Maybe you've heard of hydrocephalus. That is where the, the brain, especially in babies, can swell because the cerebral spinal fluid is blocked from draining and can cause a swelling. So if you look here at the cerebral spinal fluid flowing around, there's the blood and blood vessels, and then the cerebral spinal fluid is in the ventricles. There's the choroid plexus kind of filtering that blood. Okay, let's look at some major divisions of the brain. Again, we're just going through some basics here. We have the central nervous system. We have the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. And there's some different properties to the cells that are in there, the brain and the spinal cord. Then we have the peripheral nervous system that branch out away from the spinal cord, away from the brain. They go to the fingers, and they go to the glands, and they go to the muscles. Now the peripheral nervous system can be further divided into autonomic and somatic. Somatic is, you know, we have control over somatic, goes to our muscles. Autonomic, we have less control over. Um, I always think of autonomic as automatic. It automatically causes things to happen. The autonomic is further divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Let's look at those. Okay, so here's the brain and the spinal cord. Brain and spinal cord, central nervous system. And then in the peripheral nervous system, you have the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic is activated during arousal states. They kind of counteract each other. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, um, it's, it's in a very arousal state. When you're scared, when you're fearful. My research in my lab measures the autonomic nervous system. So when people are a little upset or excited or aroused by the things that they're doing on the computer screen, we're going to get greater sympathetic activity. Eyes, lungs, heart, heart rate increases, not as much digestion, blood vessels constrict so that more blood flows through at a higher pressure. Parasympathetic is much more relaxed. The pupils constrict, slowing the heart rate, a lot more digestion going on. Not all the blood is being rushed to the muscles. We don't need that high blood pressure. So if you're being uh, 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 chased by a bear, then your sympathetic nervous system is going to be active. And if you relax at home, your parasympathetic nervous system is going to be activated automatically, without control. Sympathetic? Ah! Ah, parasympathetic. It's all good. Somatic? That's that muscle. That's that conscious control of activity. So that kind of gives you just a brief overview. We're going to come back to these terms later. We're going to come back to these terms later um, when we talk about very specific things. Uh, about hunger and addiction and and brain damage and memory and all those kinds of stuff. But you need a little bit of foundation to understand it.